Hi, I'm Zuhra and together with my partner Anissa, we are going to talk about state's responsibilities. State's responsibility is when a state violates an international obligation owed to another state. It may occur when a state abuses the nationals of another state or acts opposite to a legal binding decision of a competent international organization such as the Security Council. All that concerning state's responsibility are regulated on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts 2001. Besides, it also states on circumstances precluding wrongfulness or defense and reparation for injury. In general, state's responsibility compromise of two elements which are one, unlawful acts or omission that can be accounted for by the states. Thus, international responsibility that is not causing injury, be it moral or material, may still involve consequences to the offender state. Second, unlawful acts or omission that constitute a breach of an international obligation of the state. We always mention international obligation or legally binding decisions and what is actually that. In simple words, it's actually treaties, convention, charters in which it regulates provisions concerning matters that are already discussed and agreed by the states. It can also be an international customary law that all states must abide by. Who are the state's organs that must be responsible? According to Article 4, the one who should be responsible are the executive, judicial, and legislative organs of the state, such as the police, government officials, and armed forces. Now we are going to talk about the Iranian hostage crisis in 1979. The background of the case is that, first, Iranian long negative contention towards U.S. meddling with Iranian affairs. The 1953 coup in Iran that toppled Mossadegh was the plan by American CIA and British intelligence to secure the oil industries, and many Iranians condemned the U.S. interference in their affairs and slowly grew anti-American feelings. Second one is that the U.S. allowed Iranian expel Shah to enter the U.S. to get cancer medical treatment, and when Jimmy Carter allowed the Shah to enter U.S., the anti-American sentiment in Iran exploded. They asked for the U.S. to extradite the Shah to face trial in Iran, and the former Shah is a dictator and failed to improve Iran economies as he buy billions of dollars on U.S. weapons. On November 4, 1979, the Muslim student followers of the Imam's policy invaded the United States Embassy in Tehran and took the American diplomatic and consular staff hostage. The militants damaged the embassy and destroyed embassy documents. U.S. consulates in Tabriz and Shiraz were also seized. The conduct of militants could not be directly attributed to the Iranian state. However, the state had done nothing to prevent the attack, stop it, or oblige the protester to withdraw from the premises and release the hostages. The militants took 66 hostages, mostly diplomats and embassy employees. They released 13 people a few days later, but 52 hostages remained in the embassy compound for 444 days. They were released on January 20, 1981. Iran announced that hostages will remain in the embassy compound until the U.S. returned the former Shah of Iran for trial. On November 29, 1979, the U.S. filed a claim a claim against Iran in the ICJ alleging the violation of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and Consular Relations. Iran declined to submit formal documents and participate in the proceedings because the hostage situations resulted from years of American interference and oppression against Iran. The question that the court must answer is that since the event happened in the U.S. Embassy compound that is inviolable according to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and Consular Relations, was Iran responsible for the event and was Iran violated its diplomatic duties to the U.S.? The U.S. government argued that the government of Iran tolerates and encouraged the attacks of militants on the U.S. embassy compound. They failed to prevent and punish the militants, therefore violated its international legal obligation to the U.S. as both countries are part of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and Consular Relations. Iran also violated the Treaty of Amity, Economic Relations and Consular Rights between the United States and Iran. Iran countered the argument by saying that the ICJ cannot and should not take cognizance of the case which the U.S. has submitted. The Islamic Revolution of Iran is deeply rooted and is a revolution against its oppressors. Its effect is essentially and directly a matter within the national sovereignty of Iran. The issue submitted to the ICJ represents only half of the overall problems. It cannot be studied separately as it involves 25 years of continual interference by the US in internal affairs of Iran, exploitation and crimes against Iranian people. The court's interim decision was that Iran must take all steps to redress the situation and must immediately release each individual hostage as they are protected by Article 45 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And latest development of the case is that the court could not and should not entertain the case. The court was not called upon to deliver a further judgment on the reparation for the injury caused to the U.S. In 12 May 1981, the case was removed from the list following discontinuance.
Hello and get the Karatna and Anissa and I will be the next presenter to talk about the other uh, two other cast. The first cast is Amalan cast. It's cast that illustrated defense of state sovereign. This case occurred on March 22, 1929, where a British aircraft carrier that had been registered in Canadian Sea when led by Captain Jack Kendall and tasked with delivering reserve and supplies of alcoholic beverages to U.S. was deemed illegal to sail. Ships that sail to U.S. must, of course, pass through a border system that has been determined by U.S. itself as a form of respect for U.S. sovereign territory. But at the time, many ships sailed illegally to avoid coast border fees set by U.S., including the Amalan ship which was suspected of having entered the 200-mile territorial boundary set by the U.S. The ship Amelin was captured by the U.S. Uh, Navy military forces for processing under the provision of the U.S. government regulation. However, when the Coast Guard intended to stop the Amelin ship for questioning, the ship didn't want to stop and continued its journey which led to a two-day chase by the Walcott ship. After the chase, Walcott ship with other ships that joined fire on the Amelin ship until it sank. The sinking of Amelan led to a six-year six diplomatic incident as international law allows hot pursuit to continue on the high seas, but the Canadian government denies that Amelan ever ventured close enough to U.S. territorial waters and wrote about the involvement of the Coast Guard. Whereas under the 1924 treaty, the convention between the U.S. and Great Britain for the prevention of the smuggling for intoxicants, 43 said to 1941, 1961 gave the Coast Guard the right to seize vessels suspected of smuggling alcohol into the prohibition era US. But only if the offending vessels was within one hour of the coastline. The final decision regarding this case, which was published on January 5, 1935, was that the ship am alone sank or rather sunk in September 1928 which is a British ship that has been registered for the sensing by the government of Canada, which has been de facto legally recognized by the government of Canada. The crew of Amelon were found to have illegally transported alcoholic beverages from the U United Kingdom to the, U to the U.S. After a more in-depth review, the absence of crew members who are U.S. citizens becomes the basis for providing comp compensation for the shooting of the ship Amelon. To conclude from this case, the commissioners determined that the Canadian registered ship had been owned and operated at the, at the time of its destruction by primarily U.S. citizens, factoring into its recommendation that the U.S. pay nothing to Canada. The last case that uh, we will discuss is the Rainbow Warrior case. The Rainbow Warrior case was a dispute between New Zealand and France that arose in the aftermath of the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior. It was uh, arbitrated by UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Queller in 1986 and became significant in the subject of public international law for its implication on state responsibility. On July 10, 1985, the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior, which was due to sail to Moruro Atoll to protest French atmospheric nuclear weapons tests there, was sunk by two bomb explosions while bertrand in Auckland Harbour. New Zealand's subsequent elevation that French intelligence agents have planted the bombs caused a major international. This day's attack on the Rainbow Warrior was carefully calculated to avoid casualties. The first would be small, a warning shot to give people time to get off the boat. The second would sing it. In July 1985, a team of French agents sabotaged and sank the Rainbow Warrior, a vessel belonging to Greenpeace International, while it lay in harbor in New Zealand. One of the 11 crew members on board has been killed. Two of the agent Major Mafart and, and Captain Pryor were subsequently arrested in New Zealand and having pleaded guilty to charges of manslaughter and criminal damage, were sentenced by a New Zealand court to 10 years imprisonment. A dispute arose between French, which demanded the release of the two agents, and New Zealand, which claimed compensation for the incident. New Zealand also complained that France was threatening to dis disrupt New Zealand threat with the European communities unless the two agents were released. Moreover, the two countries re requested the Secretary General of the UN to mediate and to propose a solution in the form of a ruling, which both parties agreed in advance to accept. The Secretary General's ruling, which was given in 19, uh, 1986, required France to pay seven uh, doll US dollar million to New Zealand and to undertake not to take certain different measures injurious to New Zealand threat with the European communities. Uh, so the two states concluded an agreement in the form of an exchange of letters on 9 July 1986, the first agreement, which provided for the implementation of the ruling. Under the terms of the first agreement, Major Mafart and Captain prayer were to be transferred to a French military facility on the island of Hau for a period of not less than three years. 
they will be prohibited from leaving the island for any reason, except with the mutual consent of the two governments. To conclude from this case, the issue was in principle one of state responsibility and thus a matter of applying rules of international law. But as already noted, some of the arguments and therefore the resolution impinge on the operation of the other legal orders, most obviously national criminal law within New Zealand and France, and less directly rules and procedures within the European Commission legal order. Conciliation is an established method of dispute settlement in international law. Usually, the proposed settlement made by a conciliator is not legally binding on the parties, but in this case, France and New Zealand agreed in advance to accept the Secretary General's rulings.